his face shine upon me and be gracious to you. Lord, turn face toward you and keep you. Hi friends and family, I trust you're all doing well and like me are waiting for stage three of the lockdown to take effect. I know most of our homes are extremely busy as many work from home and also take up the role of teacher. A lot of people are also using the opportunity to learn new things from cooking and baking to online courses that will add to their CV. I read an intriguing story this week about the Grand Vizier of Persia in the 10th century. He had a library of 117,000 books, which were more likely scrolls rather than the bound books we have today. He loved his books so much that even when he traveled, he just had to take them along. He used about 400 camels, which were loaded with his library, and these camels were trained to walk in alphabetical order so he could pick which ones he wanted to read at a moment's notice. Isn't that remarkable? He had a quest for knowledge. Through the ages, knowledge and wisdom have been highly sought, and for many people, success is measured by how many degrees they have or how much they know. But there's another type of wisdom that I'd like to talk to you about, and this is the wisdom from above. If I ask you for one word that comes to mind when I mention King Solomon, you'll probably say wisdom. In Bible times, there were no computers or cell phones, but the scriptures tell us that Solomon's wisdom was known across the earth and that people from all nations travel to him just to listen to his wise words. The Queen of Sheba was one of them. She asked him difficult questions just to see if the reports she had heard was true. In 2 Chronicles 9 verse 6, she says, I did not believe what they said until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half of the greatness of your wisdom was told to me. You have far exceeded the report I heard. Now, I don't know about you, but I would love to have the wisdom of Solomon. One example the Bible gives us of King Solomon's wisdom was a dispute two women had over which of them was the real mother of a baby. They stood before the king, each pleading their case. Then King Solomon said, cut the baby in half and give each mother half of the baby. The real mother, then out of love for her baby, begged the king to spare the child and give it to the other woman so the baby could live. Wisdom is knowing how to navigate a difficult situation. Now, who gave Solomon this amazing wisdom? It was God. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 13, we read this. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, Ask me for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon answered, Now, Lord my God, you have made my servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen. Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. The Lord was pleased and said, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart. I will also give you both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. Isn't that amazing? God was so pleased that Solomon preferred wisdom over wealth and honor that he gave him all three gifts. God is always pleased with those who seek his wisdom. 
Solomon saw the rewards of godly wisdom and he wrote a lot about it to his son in the book of Proverbs. He says, do not forsake wisdom and she will preserve you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory will she deliver to you. Now, why is wisdom such a valuable commodity? The book of James tells us if we have God's wisdom, we will be peaceful, considerate, full of mercy and sincerity. And because of that, even our enemies will be at peace with us. By contrast, if we are difficult to get along with, argumentative and always putting others down, it's clear that we haven't tapped into God's wisdom. Those who have wisdom will fear God and obey his commands. Doing that automatically brings protection as it governs the decisions that we make. Also, if you have godly wisdom, people won't come to you with gossip and slander. Instead, your name will pop up when they want advice and counsel because they know they can trust you to help them make wise decisions. This type of wisdom only comes from God. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. You and I have the same opportunity Solomon had. During your prayer time, ask God for wisdom. The core of Solomon's prayer was, make me the right man for the job. I need your wisdom for this job. Solomon asked God for a listening heart. In Hebrew, the word is Shema, which means listen and obey. This is the type of heart Solomon asked for, to be able to listen to the voice of God and to be able to do what it says. God didn't just point the mouse on the wisdom icon and click download into Solomon's brain. He gave wisdom as Solomon sought wisdom. Solomon took the time to read, observe, think, discuss, and apply the will and the wisdom of God. We get wisdom as we read the word of God, pray, and fellowship with those who demonstrate the wisdom of Christ. In the words of Solomon, do not forsake wisdom and she will preserve you. Love her and she will watch over you. God gives wisdom to those who live by the wisdom that he gives them. God bless you and have a great week. Well, warm greetings, family and friends, wherever you are in South Africa and wherever you are on the planet. A very good morning to you and we trust that you and your family are safe. Most countries all across the globe are on lockdown. Day 52 for us in South Africa. We are now at level four and we know that the Lord has been gracious to us. He has strengthened us and he has kept us. Well, this morning again, we have the wonderful opportunity. Whilst we may not be able to come together physically, wherever we are online, we can worship the Lord. Social distancing does not mean social disconnect. So this is a wonderful day to rejoice, to lift up your voice, join with us. Some of the songs and hymns we will do today are a little older and I'm sure that you'll enjoy singing along with us. This is my story.
God. Wow, what a wonderful joy it is to be sons of God. We are adopted into the family of God. And we are sons of God. And we bless Him today. Greetings to you friends and family in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awesome day it is to be alive. And what a great day it is for us to come together and to share around God's holy word. Well, I think it's um, about day 59 that we are in, in terms of the lockdown. And I hope that you and your family are safe. And we trust God that this plague will end. Many people all across the world are beginning to pray. And we trust our Father that even as we come in the posture of repentance, as the church globally will come before our Father, that he will hear our prayers. Well, it's time to hear God's word. And the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number two says, Let my doctrine drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as rain drops on the tender herb and as showers on the grass. Let us bow for prayer. Our Father, we thank you today that we can pause and come to you we thank you as we sit around the word of the Lord, as families and households come together, as your sons and daughters now would hear the word of the Lord. Thank you that the word of the Lord now will drop as the rain. It will distill as the dew and showers again will come upon the grass. We dedicate and consecrate this time to you, knowing that you are with us. In Jesus name. Amen. Well, for many weeks now, we have been speaking about the ark that Noah made. The design was not given to Noah by man, but it was given by God. And it brought protection and the preservation of life for Noah and his family. Noah and his family were preserved in the midst of crises and calamity. Well, Noah was a blameless man one who walked with God and one who finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And whilst the Lord was grieved in his heart, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6 will tell us that, and God was sorry that he had made man, he preserves his image and his likeness through a grace generation, through a just man, a perfect man, one who was able to comply with all the demands and the commands of God. No one knew how to take instruction. And in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14, the instruction is given to Noah, make for yourself. That means Noah had to take on personal responsibility. And much of what we need right now on the earth is human responsibility, working with God's sovereignty. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. And we spoke in times past about how this gopher wood which was a durable, non-decaying substance that could survive harsh weather conditions is a picture of God's word. Let me submit to us today, whilst all of God's creation serves to reveal him in some way, God has willed right now that the clearest and most authoritative knowledge of him, this side of heaven, must come through his word, which is the Bible. And if you're going to survive crises, if we're going to come through this lockdown, we're going to come through COVID-19 uh, as a people who are stronger and better, as a people who are protected, then we must know how to build with the go for wood. Then it says make rooms in the ark. And then it was a very important part was to cover it with pitch, both inside and outside. This is how you shall make it. Verse 15 says the length shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 and its height 30 cubits and in previous sessions we spoke to you about how the height of the ark which is the number 30 speaks of maturity in bible numerology we find joseph at the age of 30 becomes the governor of egypt david at 30 becomes the king of israel when you look at the life of john the baptist he enters into public ministry at the age of 30 just like the lord jesus and this was in keeping with the Old Testament law, it was the age at which a young man could enter into the priesthood. We need maturity in crisis. We need mature leadership in times of crisis. 
And maturity, if you look at its original definition in the Hebrew, it's something that is fully grown, something or someone that comes to an adult stage, one who is whole and comes to perfection. Now, when you're coming to maturity as a son of God, you understand and do the will of God. You are walking in excellence. You display on the earth restraint. You are one who is displaying stability. You are not a double-minded man who is unstable in all his ways. You are stable, stable in doctrine. You are displaying stability in relationships and stability in love. A person who is mature is one who is an overcomer. And we thank God that the Lord Jesus is our pattern. He overcame the flesh, he overcame Satan, and he overcame the world. Of course, when you are coming to maturity, you don't live an isolated and insulated life. During this time of lockdown, we know that social distancing is something that has been propagated by World Health Organizations and different authorities. But social disconnecting, uh, distancing doesn't mean social disconnecting. So I trust today that we will display maturity. But our coming to maturity is determined by the diet of God's word. So we shift from milk and we come to the meat of God's word that allows us to handle crises. Now, when you speak of maturity and you speak of a mature tree, a mature tree is a tree that is fruitful. It has fruit. Now, there are many trees that come to the place of growth and development, and they provide us with shade and they are faithful trees. But we as sons of God must not just be faithful. We must come to the place and position where we are fruitful. And this is where we spoke of uh, in previous sessions of how the Lord Jesus in John 15 would speak about abiding in him. And the in him position brings us to the place where we bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit and fruit that remains. This lockdown uh, times that we've had over the last eight weeks has given us the time to draw near to God. And James says, if you draw near to him, he will draw near to us. In the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, from Genesis 45, 46 and 47, you would read of a location called Goshen. It was in Goshen that Jacob settled with his sons. Joseph provided Goshen and he spoke to Pharaoh. Pharaoh gave Goshen to Jacob and his sons. There were about 70 of them. And the word Goshen has a very prophetic meaning. It is to draw near. So as they settled in Goshen, as they dwelt in a place of drawing near, they received protection, preservation. The Bible tells us in Genesis 47 that they grew, increased and multiplied. As we draw near to God and the rest of the world, the rest of Egypt is now enslaved to death. God's divine immunity is granted to his sons who are increasing and multiplying even at this time. Whilst the world is in famine, the sons of God must flourish. The sons of God must multiply. This is when we come to the place of abiding in him. Genesis 49, 22, the Bible tells us Jacob speaks over Joseph and he says, Joseph is a fruitful bough. His branches reach over the wall. And I want to submit to us today that we need the mantle of Joseph in this hour to reconstruct economies. Joseph had the capacity to future cast. Joseph stewards on behalf of another. The pharaohs of this world in this crisis are looking for Josephs who can display the wisdom of God. And I submit to us today, like Joseph was fruitful, we too need to be fruitful and showcase maturity in several areas. Fruitfulness must be seen in our finances. And we spoke about Paul who wrote in Philippians 4 about fruit that abounds to the account of the Philippian church. That fruit was financial fruit. And how do we come to financial fruitfulness? Paul again in 1 Timothy 6, uh, in verse number 6, he wrote to his son Timothy and he says to him, Godliness with contentment is great gain. If we don't learn to live in a state of contentment, we become covetous. We fall into a snare 
and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction. That's what the scripture says. Achan, Gehazi and Judas all fell into the snare. There is financial fruitfulness that showcases maturity. Then there is family fruitfulness. And during this time, we have the wonderful opportunity to reset, to revamp, to renovate and restore the family unit. Psalm 128 verse 3 says, Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the heart of your house and your children like olive plants all around your table. Now, there have been many negative things that we have heard about this lockdown, how it has decimated economies, how there have been so many people that have lost their jobs. But there have also been a few positive things, and I'll highlight one of them. We've received many testimonies of our fathers have brought their families together around the table in the culture of Acts 2.42, where dads together with their spouses, mums, have been breaking bread and sharing the scriptures with their children. I trust today that all of this is preparing us to exit the ark and to reconfigure ourselves as we prepare for what we call a new normal. We need strong family units. We must have strong family units that would showcase the nature of our father. There's fruit of your family. There's also the fruit of righteousness. Philippians 1 verse 11 speaks about being filled with the fruits of righteousness. A mature son displays the fruit of righteousness. Whilst we are positionally made righteous through the finished work of the cross, there is a demand for us to practically flesh out all the different dynamics of righteousness on the earth. You've got to showcase good works, humility, temperance, reverent speech, being uncompromising in our walk and sincere. And then last week we dealt with the fruit of repentance. Luke chapter 3 and verse 8 speaks of bearing fruits worthy of repentance. And the word repent simply means to change your mind for the better. It is the Greek word metaneo, which means to change your mind for the better. And as sons of God, there is a demand for us to be serial repentant, repenters. Repentance is the very fruit of our belief. Sons of God must be serial repenters. That means you are consistently adjusting your walk as you journey with God the Father. For today, we will begin our reading from Isaiah chapter 32 as we begin our discourse for this morning. Isaiah 32 verse 9, it says, Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a year and some days, you will all be troubled. You complacent women, woman, for the vintage will fail. The gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent one. Strip yourselves, make yourself bare. Gird sackcloth on your ways. People shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up pawns and briars. Yes, on all the happy homes in the joyous city. Because the palaces will be forsaken. The bustling city will be deserted. The forts and towers will become lairs forever. A, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. This is a very sad picture that Isaiah is painting. And then he comes to verse number 15 and he says, Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. And then he says, once this takes place, the wilderness becomes a fruitful field. And the fruitful field is counted as a forest. The picture of this land in Isaiah 32 is one that has thorns and briars. In fact, it has a, a prickly shrub. This is what takes place in this context when people are wicked, when they are idolatrous and are evil. But when the spirit of the Lord is poured upon us, that which is a briar, that which produces thorns, the forsaken city becomes a fruitful field. The fruitful field then becomes a forest. That's multiplication. A field becoming a fruitful forest. 
And I trust that even as we believe God in this hour, that his spirit will be poured upon us from on high, that which is a tawny ground, that which is a prickly shrub, will become a fruitful forest. If we want our ground to be fruitful, if we want the place of our labors and our toils to turn from thorns into a fruitful forest, then there are fruits of the spirit that must be seen in our lives. Now, this is the consequence, the effect of the effusion, the outpouring and the outflow of the spirit of God in the season. Parts that are a wilderness, places that are barren and unfruitful, things that are unproductive and not producing anything. Those areas are going to become a fruitful field. It happens because the spirit is poured out upon us. Now, in past seasons, we saw the Holy Spirit being poured out and we only looked at it from a dynamic of a gathering. Now, in a gathering at times, the Holy Spirit is poured out and the Holy Spirit is, is given to us as a dove at times, the picture that we see. But the dynamic of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer must be seen in every microscopic detail of our lives. So the Holy Spirit, the comforter, Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit in John 14. He says, I will give to you another helper and another being one of the same alloy and substance. The Holy Spirit is our parakletos, the one who walks alongside us, the one who helps us, the one who indwells, the one who reproves and rebukes at times, the one who is our teacher, who seals and steers us. The Holy Spirit is given for us to, 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 to function in the fullness of our Father. Now, when you are a son of God, you desire to function in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord Jesus, Isaiah 11 verse 2 says, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Isaiah was describing the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word rest means to fully settle. And in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 2, Isaiah highlighted the functions of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now, in this generation that we live in, we need a generation that has the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel. When Pharaoh saw Joseph, he said to Joseph, where can we find one like you in whom is the spirit of God? Where can we find one as wise as you in whom is the spirit of God? Now that was Joseph just appearing. There was nothing superstitious or mystical taking place. Joseph was displaying superior wisdom, superior wine that comes from above. And I trust today that even as we would journey, we would begin to display the wisdom of our father because the spirit of wisdom has fully settled on us. Now, when you have this dynamic of the Holy Spirit upon you, you produce fruits of the spirit. When you read the book of Galatians chapter 5 uh, from verse 19, 20 and 21, it would give you all the acts of the flesh, adultery, fornication, outbursts of wrath, dissensions. And from verse 22 and 23 it describes all the fruit of the spirit. In fact, you can take every fruit of the spirit and you can contrast it to every act of the flesh. Can tabulate for every act of the flesh there is a fruit of the spirit as sons of God we must display the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the first fruit Galatians 5 and verse 22 says but the fruit of the spirit the first fruit is love the second fruit is joy so when you are a son of God you have the fruit of the spirit being love being joy, then it's peace. Matthew chapter 5 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. A son of God who is coming to maturity produces fruit, and the fruit of the Spirit must be seen. 
For the time we have left today, we're going to speak about two fruits this morning. The first fruit of love, the proton, the primary fruit, and out of that fruit, all the other fruits begin to flow. And we will also speak of the fruit of joy. Now, love is described to us uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he begins writing. He follows up from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he describes all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And now in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or clanging cymbal. Then he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but if I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though, my, and though I give my body to be burnt, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And then he begins to describe not phileo love, the love of friends, not eros love, the love that you would share between spouses. This is agape love. And in 1 Corinthians 13, verse number four, or verse number four, he describes love and he says, love is patient. The word for patient in the original Greek is the word hupomone. It means to be enduring, to be steadfast, to remain under challenges and to be constant. Love is patient. When you when you have to define this word in the original Greek, hupomone, it means one who is able to wait for another who is not at his or her pace. When you are patient, when you describe, when you have the love of our father, you are able to wait for someone who is not at your pace. You refuse to retaliate in anger. In fact, you will defer anger. Love is patient. Love is kind. And this word kind, love is kretos. This means to furnish another with that which is suitable for his or her journey and task. Now, when you display this kindness, you are benevolent. You are beneficial to all those that are around you. Even in the giving of gifts, you are able to furnish another with that which is suitable for his or her task. It's very important for us to see this because when you give someone a gift, you can just give a gift or you can say, I want to prophetically speak into your journey and display the kind benevolence of my father. Love is patient. Love is kind. And this word kindness is very interesting. It was used to describe favors done without expectation of return. Love is patient. Love is kind. When you are kind, you are willing to help. And during this crisis of COVID-19, we need to display the agape of God. We need to showcase this level of maturity and fruitfulness. And we must be willing to help for nothing in return. Now we live on a continent and we live in an era where people will only give to someone who can do something for them. But in this generation, sons of God must arise who can be fruitful. In Genesis 24, you can read about it. We're introduced to a lady whose name is Rebecca. Rebecca was the mother of Jacob and Esau. And Rebecca's name means to be tied or to be knotted. When we are tied and knotted to the vine, we are able to display kindness. The servant of Abraham, Eliezer, goes to Rebekah and he asks for a drink of water and she then offers to provide water for the camels. This is a sign of a true church, of a true believer, one who has no hidden agenda. This is not like the harlot of Proverbs chapter 7 that has a hidden agenda. The good Samaritan was willing to help. The Lord Jesus Christ displayed compassion and was willing to help. Did you know the love of Christ and the love of our father, the agape of God does not need an invitation. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 and verse 27, do not withhold good when it is in your power to do it. 
Do not withhold good when it is in your power to do it. I pray today that as sons of God, we will be fruitful in this season, in this hour, and we will display the kind benevolence of our father like Rebecca did. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. To envy is to desire that which belongs to another. You also want to possess that which is in the hand of another. David wanted Bathsheba and that was a sign of envy. When we connect envy and covetousness, we find that some of its roots are in materialism. As sons of God, we're part of the family of God. And as you would journey on the earth, we must learn to celebrate the successes of others. We must learn to celebrate the successes of others. When you are envious, when you are covetous, you are like Achan. You are like Gehazi. You become like Judas. Achan was covetous. And when you read Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 21, this is what Achan said. Joshua 7 verse 21. He says, when I saw the spoils, the beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, the wedge of gold, I coveted them and took them. And then he says, I hid them in the earth, in the midst of my tent. You see, Achan hides this in the earth, in the midst of his tent. That means he places it into the foundation. This is the problem with many people. We have foundational cracks. We call them salvic cracks, salvation cracks, where there are root issues that are producing fruit. If we don't deal with the root of covetousness, we will produce fruit that affects many generations. He hid it in the earth. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Love does not envy. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. When you parade yourself, you boast of self. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says in verse 31, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. When you parade yourself, this is a descriptor of a military procession involving the marching of troops. It is an ostentatious display to assume a false or misleading appearance. Agape, the love of our father, does not boast about self. When you parade yourself, you flaunt, you show off, you become boastful. This is not a sign of maturity. In fact, it is a sign of foolishness and immaturity. And we will not survive the crisis if we continue to parade ourselves. The Bible says in Colossians 3 and verse 3, For you died and your life is hidden in Christ. As sons of God, we must know how to remain hidden in Christ. Did you know everything that is precious in the earth is hidden? Gold is hidden. Diamonds are hidden. And you as a son of God must know how to hide yourself in the cleft of the rock. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. That means love is not proud and it does not have a, an inflated self-esteem. The Lord Jesus Christ personified agape and when he came into the earth in Philippians chapter 2 the Bible tells us in Philippians 2 and verse 5 let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus and then it tells you the mind of Christ it begins to describe this mind he made himself of no reputation took on the form of a bond servant this is what we need to do have the mind of Christ love is not puffed up then love is not rude. And I really believe that if we are going to become fruitful and produce this fruit of the spirit, this proton, this first fruit of the spirit, then we need to know how to, how to overcome rudeness. I was um, reading an article this week by Meryl Maku, who wrote in the Wall Street Journal an article titled The Renaissance of Rudeness. She describes how rudeness is finding itself more and more acceptable in today's culture. 
public behavior and words that were unthinkable a generation ago are now becoming a commonplace. The fact is that rudeness is rooted in selfishness. Manners, and we have to teach our children manners. We have to teach them table manners. What it is to sit at a table, what it is to wait for another. Manners are meant to reduce the frictions between humans. Discourtesy reveals a lack of consideration for other. The ill-mannered person is communicating this. This is what they're saying. It's all about me. The agape of God, by contrast, cannot be selfish for the simple reason that agape is deeply concerned about the other person's well-being. Therefore, love has to become mannerly again. When we say love is not rude, the Greek phrase there is saying love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not act inappropriately. The opposite of rudeness is honor. This is a very important part of our journey as sons of God because we must know how to show honor to our father, how to show honor to our parents, how to show honor to civil authority. There is a generation that has to arise who know how to show honor again and overcome the rudeness that we see. In the matrix of love, there is honor. In the matrix of agape, there is great honor. And during this time, we have to teach our children how to overcome rudeness. They spent many times, or much time uh, during uh, the past years in schools. They have spent times in institutions. And in our homes again, the Eden of God has got to arise where we have well-watered gardens that can showcase honor. Love is not rude. Then it says love does not seek its own. That means love is not selfish. And as sons of God, we don't act for our own gain. We are people that are not selfish. We have the posture of the lamb where we live selflessly, sacrificially, wanting to live like the lamb for the benefit of another. As sons of God in this season and in this hour, I trust that we will know how to overcome selfishness. Love thinks no evil. Love doesn't think evil. When you see others coming toward you, the Bible would tell us in, in, in the NIV, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love is not resentful. That's what the English Standard Version says. The Amplified says, love takes no account of evil. This is very interesting because it's saying love keeps no record of wrong. When Peter came toward the Lord Jesus and you know, Peter denied him. Jesus didn't linger on it. He gave Peter preferential treatment. And when the scriptures are telling us that love keeps no record of wrong, it is in fact using an accounting term. It is a bookkeeping term, meaning there is an account. Uh, that's placed on a balance sheet, but love does not keep any record of it. Sometimes a person might reason that they are keeping this on account of wrong suffered out of some form of self-preservation. But I say to us today, don't be a scorekeeper. Know how to, how to be someone who administers forgiveness and you are able to let go. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. That means when your enemy falls, you do not rejoice. When Saul died, when King Saul died, David was installed as king and Saul sought consistently to kill and assassinate David. David did not rejoice. David showcased that deep within him, this man who was the anointed of the Lord, who had a measure of the Holy Spirit, he showcased the agape. He did not celebrate the death of his foe. In fact, he said, tell it not in Gath. He called Saul the Lord's anointed. And then he wrote the song of the bow. And then he continued by bringing Saul's descendants to his table. 
Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Love bears all things. To bear means to cover. That means you don't cover up, but you don't take pleasure in exposing another person's misgivings, shortcomings, and their sins. It doesn't take pleasure in exposing others. Love hopes all things. Love is never negative. When you have the agape of God, now I know we're going through a very difficult time, but when you have the agape of God, when you have Christ in you, the hope of glory, you are able to say like Job said, and we read from Job chapter 14 verse 7 a few weeks ago, for there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again, that its tender shoots will not cease. When you have the agape of God in you, this love is not negative, and, 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 it, and it is a love that has hope. I say to us, if we have the hope um, the, of, of agape, we will see beyond COVID-19. We will be able to declare that South Africa will be a blessed land because love hopes all things. Even in the midst of all forms of negativity, you must not lose hope. And you can declare, like Paul writing to the church at Rome, what shall separate us? From the love of Christ. In fact, he, he wrote, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In the midst of all of that's happening around us, shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or peril? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Love thinks no evil. And then it says, love never fails. In the context of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul was saying, your prophecy will fail. All the stuff we do will fail. But love never fails. Now, for the time that we have left today, I want to speak to us about the second fruit of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that I believe is very, very vital for us in this day and age. Many people out there are going through much and we need this dimension of the anointing. We need the oil of joy, the fruit of the anointing, the fruit of the spirit called joy. Psalm 45 and verse seven, this is what David says. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. The writer to the book of Hebrews in Hebrews 1 and verse 9 quotes this verse verbatim and he says, Therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Now whenever you see oil in the Bible, oil is a descriptor encrypted in all the oils of the scriptures is the anointing. There is holy oil, there is fragrant oil to change atmospheres, there is beaten oil, there is excellent oil, there is shepherd's oil. But today, just for a short while, we want to speak about the oil of gladness. Now, the oil of gladness is actually the oil of joy. Many times we confuse joy and happiness. Oftentimes, both these words, joy and happiness, are used synonymously, but if you get to the root of them biblically, you will find that they differ. Happiness is a state of bliss. Happiness is temporal and fleeting. Happiness is often related to your circumstances. So you have happy moments because of happenings. You go on a holiday, you are happy. You buy a new car, you are happy. You watch your favorite sport, you are happy. And over the last two months, we have had all of the happenings cut down. So there's no happenings taking place. And a lot of people now are falling into depression. But joy is different from happiness. Joy is a sustained feeling of contentment despite the circumstances. Joy is a sustained feeling of contentment irrespective of your circumstances. Do you know happiness can be bought? But joy cannot be bought. Joy remains the same. 
It is constant in the face of all trials and tribulations. Today, I pray even as we share the word of God with you, as you hear the, 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 the verses that we would read, as we engage with doctrine today, that your joy will be restored. You will receive the oil of gladness. Paul, um, James writing in James 1 and verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Globally right now, people are in crisis. And the command of God for us in this season is for us to trust in the Lord. We look into the perfect law of liberty. We look into his word. Whilst we remain in this place, in this nation or in your nation, we must count it all joy when we fall into various trials. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul is writing from prison. He is in a place of incarceration. He is in an environment where Paul can't get out. And he says, rejoice in the Lord, verse 4. And again, I say, rejoice. How could a man find such contentment even in a place uh, where he couldn't move. I say to us, Paul tapped in to the oil of gladness. The word rejoice is derived from the word joy. And the prophet Habakkuk in Habakkuk 3.17 says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, no fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, Though the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, he says this in verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Nehemiah had many people come up against him. He had great opposition in building the wall. And in Nehemiah 8 verse 10, he says in the latter part of the verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord must become our strength. We need strength for every part of our journey. And without joy, without sustained gladness, we can't do anything. There was a church they were called the Macedonian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Macedonian church, the Bible says in verse uh, 2 of chapter 8, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep Poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. The Macedonian church were the poorest of the poor. But this church found it easy to give because they had joy. And the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. We need the oil of gladness until the spirit is poured upon us. This is a dimension of the anointing that we must tap into. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now that sounds almost paradoxical. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Lord Jesus was motivated by a deep sense of joy. In Matthew 13 and verse 44, it says the kingdom of heaven is like hidden treasure in a field. A man found and hid and for joy over it, he sells all that he has and buys that field. The motivation is joy. We cannot serve God without joy. Serve the Lord with gladness. This is important. It is imperative. Psalm 23, and many of us have been reading this, quoting it, teaching it to our children. Psalm 23, David writes and says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. And today, you've got to declare, I shall not lack joy. The sustained measure of contentment, despite all the crises that are around us, we, might, we must have inner joy. And this is a mark of our genuineness and our authenticity. That despite everything around us, we still have the joy of the Lord. Jesus says in John 15 and verse 11, these things I have spoken to you. This is concerning abiding in him. And he says that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. 
Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And this joy comes from God our Father through His Son. And it is made manifest through the person of the Holy Spirit as a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is not related to any circumstance on the earth. Joy is sustained gladness despite the circumstances. This week I had the opportunity to speak to a clinical psychologist. And during our conversation, she's been speaking to us about several people that have fallen into depression. Whilst many hospital beds are being filled with COVID-19 patients, many hospitals are also being filled now with people who are becoming depressed during this time. Uh, many health journals have been written that showcase by the year 2030, the number one killer in the world will not be cardiovascular disease, heart disease, but it will be depression. Many people have fallen into depression and there are a few signs that you are depressed. Number one, when you wake up in the morning, you feel really sad and you don't want to get out of bed. You lose your passion for the things that you love to do. You feel a sense of emptiness. These are signs of, of depression. You are irritable and angry and you may even become suicidal. Now, when you speak to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, they will tell you that this is an emergency and they have several ways in which they deal with it. Number one is, is they, they try to, to get you out in the sunlight. And this is very important for us. We get some vitamin D because vitamin D is a mood stabilizer. It's also important that you try to do a little bit of physical exercise. You up your omega-3 and you also try to eat a nutritious and a balanced diet. And while psychologists and psychiatrists and, and those in the medical fraternity will see depression as an emergency, for us as sons of God, when we see the signs, this is also an emergency because we have lost one of the dimensions of the anointing. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 8, it speaks about a woman who had lost one coin. She would have 10 coins placed on her forehead. It was a bracelet given to her by her husband. And this woman had lost one coin. So she goes and she searches the house to find the one coin. The loss of the coin, the loss of one of those 10 coins, deeply affected her appearance. Because when her husband would come, he would think she was being unfaithful because the priest had a right to remove a coin if he found that the wife had been unfaithful. So she goes into crisis mode. These 10 coins are a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus ascended and after he ascended for ten, after 10 days uh, after he had ascended, he gave the gift, the seal and the promise of the Holy Spirit to his church. And when we are missing one coin, when the one coin is not seen, it is a absence of a dimension of the Holy Spirit. Have we lost the oil of gladness? Have we lost the joy of the Lord? I want to say to us today that the Lord has come that we might have a life and have it more abundantly. The Lord Jesus would speak of in Luke chapter 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he would tell us the spirit of the Lord is upon him so that he could set the captives free and to console those who mourn in Zion. And I pray today that we will have a restoration of our joy. Isaiah says in Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in God. Today, we must know as sons of God how to access the oil of gladness. Now, throughout the scripture, there's a demand for personal responsibility. Now, we can speak of the anointing. We can speak of the fruit, but it is up to us to access the oil. There is an assignment, beloved. There is an assignment of demons to bring God's people into depression. I submit to us today, you don't have to fear because God has given us the technology in his word to overcome, to fight back, to resist. Uh, and this is the fruit of the spirit. It is the anointing and we have the Holy Spirit with us. So today, 
we have to know how to access this measure of the anointing. And there's a demand for personal responsibility. Someone provided the two fish and the five loaves. Someone had to dig the trench for the water to flow. There was a donkey and a colt that was provided. Naaman had to dip seven times. And today there's a demand for us to take personal responsibility when it comes to our growth and our maturity and for us to access the oil of gladness. In John 13 and verse number 13, here's our first key. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for I, so I am. If I then your Lord and your teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, a model, a template that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent, sent me no, is he who sent greater than the one who sent him. And in the context of this portion of scripture that's found for us in Matthew, uh, or rather in John chapter 13, Jesus says to them something that's very interesting. John chapter 13, and you can read about it. He says in verse 17, if you know these things, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The word blessed means joyful joyful are you if you know how to do this now washing another's feet was seen as a menial task to access the joy of gladness we must know how to perform menial tasks jesus is saying i get joy when i wash your feet and he says i get joy when i serve the body of christ Many people have a sense of entitlement during this time that we have to reset during this time that we have to renovate our minds. We must be able to come to this place where we desire to serve others. You have joy deficiency and great grace deficiency because we cannot serve others. Let's start in our homes. If you want to access the oil of gladness, if you want to access joy, we must, we must enjoy serving one another. Elisha served Elijah all the way to the Jordan. He was able to access a double portion. Joshua served Moses. He was able to enter into the promised land. David served Jesse. He entered into kingship. During this lockdown, if you're going to access this joy, Jesus said, blessed are you, joyful are you, if you do this, if you do the menial task, serve your spouse, serve your spouse. The simple task of preparing a meal, maybe even making a cup of tea. Children, I submit to you, we need to know how to serve our parents. Servanthood is a posture of the land but it is also the posture of the Son of God. It is abnormal for us as sons of God to expect others to serve us. We will not come to this place where we access joy. Your first key to access the oil of gladness is to serve others. I'm so thankful to God when I hear of testimonies, so many sons of God serving others in their community. Some of you have been involved in programs where you have been handing out food parcels to those who are needy and who are lacking food even at this crucial hour. My prayer is that we'll continue to perform menial service. The second key is found in Acts chapter 2. This is when we come to live in the culture and the habitat of God. Acts 2.42 tells us, the early church continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Four pillars. This is what the early church lived in. Apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. This is the culture. This is the habitat. This is the place where we need to dwell in. Just like fish in the sea, like birds in the air. We are designed for the culture of Acts 2.42. The first pillar they continued steadfastly 
in apostles doctrine. If you say you don't love God's word, it's almost like a fish saying, I don't want to be in water. Doctrine was first. The first thing was the word of God. He who turns his ear from hearing the word of God, even, even his prayer shall be an abomination unto God. If we want joy in the season, we must get the culture right. Lockdown has given us the opportunity to reset the culture of our home. Culture is simply defined as a system of habits. What are your system of habits? The early church in Acts 2.42, they continued with these four pillars. And by the time you get to Acts 2 and verse number 47, the Bible says they were praising God, having favor with all people. And the Bible says in verse 46, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. The early church, after installing the culture, had gladness in their hearts. Gladness, the oil of joy, was a product of the installation of a culture. I pray today that in this season, we will install the right culture. Get the family altars back in place. There's a lovely book that I will encourage all of you to, to get. It's called The Power of Habit. A great book by Charles D. Duke. It showcases how we can give up bad habits and reconfigure healthy habits. This is a time whilst we don't have um, the, the sale of alcohol and tobacco. You can reset during lockdown to give up unhealthy habits. If we want joy, we must get the culture right. The culture is Apostles Doctrine fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, doctrine is the cure for depression. Doctrine is the cure for depression. David in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, he strength, strengthened himself in the Lord. This is a time when we need to turn off our televisions, time for us to get on our knees, time for us to open up the scriptures, to eat the book and to enjoy God's word like never before. My prayer is that as you engage with God, the Holy Spirit, the oil of gladness will return to our homes. There'll be laughter. There'll be singing. There'll be uh, like Paul in prison. He would know how to, you would know how to declare rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Well, let's bow for prayers today as we commit ourselves to the Lord. Abba Father, we thank you that your grace is sufficient. We bless you today and we thank you that as we grow up into you, we would know how to express fruits of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the fruit of love, this first fruit of love, love that is patient, love that is kind, love that is not puffed up, love that does not seek its own desires, love that hopes all things, Love that bears all things. Thank you today for a baptism in the love of our Father. I pray this over your children, that we'll be baptized in the love of Abba Father. I also pray today that during this time, that we will experience the fruit of joy. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our homes. Thank you today that we will no longer have heavy hearts as we install the culture of Acts 2.42 as we again begin to serve one another and start in our homes, we will begin to experience joy unspeakable. We bless you today, our Father. We pray today that your hand of protection will be upon us. Thank you today that you will protect us, those who are serving, those who are going out into the marketplace. I thank you that you'll preserve them and you'll protect them. Over all our families, as we dwell under the shadow of the Almighty, we thank you for the preservation of our lives in this hour. We bless you today and we commit our lives to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, it's been great sharing God's word with you. Stay safe and remember, social distance is not social disconnecting. Stay in touch with your family and friends. And we're hoping to hear some great news from our president in the coming days. Maybe we will go down to the next level of lockdown in the coming weeks. God richly bless you.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you.